Good evening. Selamat petang. I've just learned new things today that it doesn't mean like selamat malam in Malaysia because Indonesian will say good evening is selamat malam. So good things that I ask um, Mrs. Doris, thank you so much. Um, I would like to share to all of you a story of 15 years in seven minutes. I know it's magic, right? I hope I'll do it right. But before I start telling you a story about what the Lord has done in my life, I would like to ask you one important question that you may answer in your heart. This is the question. What was the best gift you ever gave to someone? Remember, the best gift you ever gave to someone. Have that in the back of your mind, because I'm, come back, I'm coming back to that. I start working super early when I was 14 as a full-timer model in New York City. And I was excited to be in New York, even though I have rough beginnings. Remember the movie Home Alone 2? I had similar experience because they forgot to pick me up. For three days, I stayed in the hotels. It was so much fun. I like it. <laughs> but then I started to work, and I started to have two worlds. One is very glamour, and one is full of pain and hard work. So I would like to talk about the glamour side just for tonight. The glamour side of the work, which involved lots of party, lots of fun, people wear beautiful things, and yet, in the middle of lots of crowd, I feel alone. Have you had that kind of experience before? When you're in the middle of so many people and you feel alone. You're lonely, but you also feel alone. At that time, I thought that was normal. I thought it was normal. I saw people laugh. I also laugh. It's easy in the industry where you can actually put mask and be happy at any time or be, you can switch your mood easily because that's the work that they require to act, to pretend, to be somebody that you know. But there is something within my heart, there's a cry in my heart. Why do I feel this emptiness? Why do I feel alone even in the middle of many people? Why do I feel meaninglessness? Why? I'm supposed to be happy. My friend told me, Tracy, you're so lucky. You live in a dream world. You meet up with celebrity, you hang out in, the, you know, in New York City. And I was lost. And Christ found me. I was in Paris, in a city that's so memorable for me. Because in that city, Christ found me. I always thought the story about Jesus Christ is an urban legend. It's not true. It happened maybe a long time ago, but maybe it's not true. Until my friend pushed me to go to church. I went to church with her, and I saw a kind of face in that church, a happiness I'd never seen before, a true joy, a smile that's so genuine. I'm in the industry that I know what it means to, to have a fake smile. And this is not a fake smile. They're really, really happy. And through that experience, Christ found me. No one told me that someone loved me so much that he will to, he's willing to die on the cross to save me. No one told me that on that cross, when he bleed, is to save me, is to wash me, to wash my sins away. No one told me that. And when I find out that someone loved me and cared for me and willing to transform my life and give meaning to my life, the world changed. And what happened is that I come before the Lord and I ask for forgiveness. I ask God 
to take away my sins. You know, before I met Christ, before, before he found me, I thought I'm such a good girl. I don't do drugs, I don't sleep around, I don't do crazy things, I don't get drunk. And yet when he found me, and somehow he speaks to me about what happened in my life, and I realize I'm a sinner, I truly need his grace, I need his forgiveness. When I repent before the Lord, I ask him, please take this away from me. I hate my sins. I hate what I've done in the past. I hate it, Lord. And he surely did. He take my sins away. How do I know he takes my sins away? Because honestly, for many years, there's a burden in my shoulder. It seems like there's nothing in it, but there's a heavy sense. And when I repent, it feels so light in the heart, at the back of my shoulder, and I know and I sense that I've been washed, that sin has been washed from me. And it was amazing. It was an amazing feeling because finally I realized, wow, I'm not just an object, I'm not just a model, I'm someone's important in God's eyes. And now someone finally told me that you were made in God's image. You're precious in God's eyes. He redeemed you, He changed you, He renewed you, and you will never be the same again. No one outside of Christianity ever told me that. And in Christ alone, I experienced that salvation, the ministry of reconciliation, that Christ Himself come, the King of kings, the Lord of Lords, come to rescue someone and life never be the same again. Have you ever received something that more than you ask for? Have you ever received a gift that more than you ask for? You ask for something small, and He gives you so much more than you could ever imagine. And that is Christ. I just ask, may He take that sins away from me. You know what He gave me? He did give me that He washed my sins away, but he also restored my identity in Christ. That I no longer feel insecure, I feel secure in him alone. Like nothing else, the name, the one I have, any everything else means nothing. Because my identity is no longer in me, but in Christ. And not only that, he gave me restorations. He gave me restorations. He gave me renewal of mind and heart. What does it mean, restorations? In my youth, the opportunity to study has been taken away from me because I work. And in his redemption story, he blessed me. In 2006, I studied theology for three years, apologetics and theology for three years. It's God's grace because nothing I can do to bring me to Oxford, but because his grace alone that I can come to Oxford and study. And not only that, four years ago, he called me to be a pastor in a church in Jakarta. And not only that, just 21 days ago, I officially joined RZIM and to be a and speaker, to be evangelist, to share the goodness of the gospel. Look at the Lord that we worship. He's not only take away people's sins, He also restored, He renewed, He gives so much more than I ever asked for. This is the Lord that we worship. The God who changed life and renewed life. And this is the question that linked to the first and second questions. If the first one, what is the best gift you ever give to someone? And the second one is the best gift that you ever received more than you asked for. But the last questions, before I end it, what is the best gift you ever gave to God? At first, I thought an hour of my time a day would be enough where I can pray to Him and worship Him and read Scripture together you know, listen to him through scripture. No, 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 an hour is not enough. Maybe eight hours. No, 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 eight hours is not enough. Maybe 24 hours. No, 24 hours is not enough. Maybe 24 7. No, it's not enough. Maybe 365 days a year. No, it's not enough. Maybe my whole lifetime. Yes, my whole lifetime. I shall give my whole lifetime for his glory to bring this good news to the world. So people like me before can know that if someone loved them, that we need to die on the cross, 
not only to save them, to wash their sins away, but at the same time, to give more than they can ask for, to give them life to the fullest. What is the gift that you can give to God today? I take the commitment to give it all, because what does it mean to gain the world when you lose your soul? I rather gain my soul in the cost of losing the world. And here is the Lord that we worship. We all worship in this place. God restored, He renewed, and He equipped us to be, to join His mission in reconciliations ministry. Be out there to share the good news to the world that Christ died not only for all of us in this room, but also for those people out there who need Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless all of you and give your best to God more than give the very best that you can give to Him who deserves the very best of us. God bless you all. Wow. Thank you so much, Tracy, for that. This is amazing. She spoke to us this morning about image and identity that many, many people struggle with. And it's so important to get hold of that DVD and watch again all the whole thing of the conference. I believe, friends, you know, it will really bless your heart that the whole image identity is something, as I say, we struggle with, that even her own mother couldn't recognize her because when she walked with her mother in Brazil in a huge shopping mall, there's a huge poster, Mango, she's advertising for. She told her mom, that's me. The mom said, no way. That's me, mom, no way. Until she showed something to the mom on the poster. Friends, for more, get hold of the DVD. <laughs> you can see your pastor makes a good businessman. <laughs> well, friends, you know, really, all right, we've been really, really blessed at a conference, uh, okay? Uh, all right, and uh, what a delight once again to be able to have uh, Michael Ramston back uh, with us speaking to us. He's an outstanding apologist. Apologist is not someone who makes apologies all the time, okay, but someone who seeks to defend the faith in a clear, in a cogent, in a convincing manner. And that's so important. It's an increasing to connect all right, the world of Scripture with the world that we're living in and make it relevant and effective uh, for all of us Michael is married with one wife and three children, okay? They live in Oxford, and he hates up. He's a CEO of RZIM, the Ravi Zaka International Ministry, and uh, God has used him in amazing ways in over 80 countries around the world, speaking to all kinds of people, including, if you believe it, the Taliban as well. You know, so let's put our hands welcome. Michael is a come to speak to all of us, okay? He's not completely, he's half English and half Middle Eastern. And there's another wonderful combination. You find in all of Ravi Zacharias ministry, they're all confused. They're not sure who they are, including Howard Abbey as well. Okay, put your hands, would you? Let's, let's pray for uh, Michael as he speaks. Father, we thank you again for this servant of yours. Use him to speak to our hearts and our lives and challenge us, O oh God, we pray, in response that your name will be glorified, O oh God, we ask. In Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. 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 Thank Bless you. you. Okay. Well, it's lovely to be here with you in uh, Kuala Lumpur. The last time I was here, about a year and a half ago, I was here uh, with my uh, boss and my colleague, Dr. Ravi Zacharias. Um, but um, this year, um, I think he was with you in May, um, but for this time of year, they couldn't find anyone good, so I agreed um, I would come uh, to speak. Uh, it's a challenge for me to follow Tracy. We're now moving from someone who has beautiful hair to someone who's simply hairy, and so, <laughs> Um, there will be a change of, of pace. Uh, let me also just uh, commend Dr. Chris Wright to you, uh, for those of you who are thinking of coming to hear him. Um, I don't know him well personally. We've met several times and spoken a couple of times on the same platforms, um, and we've chatted occasionally when we've had the opportunity. He is a tremendously gifted Bible teacher. He is uh, deeply insightful. He's a wonderful communicator. You will love spending time with him. Um, I remember reading his commentary um, on Ezekiel on the, in the Bible Speaks Today, a brilliant, insightful, wonderful, edifying uh, commentary, and a very, very knowledgeable man. I'm a little disappointed to hear that he likes jogging. Um, there seems to be a jogging, jogging epidemic breaking out amongst Christian leaders. Um, I myself do not go jogging. Um, the reason I do not jog is it's not biblical to go jogging. 
Um, the scripture clearly teaches in Proverbs 28.1, only the guilty run when no one is chasing them. <laughs> and so, um, so for that reason, I don't, I don't engage in that or any other unbiblical activity. Now, tomorrow morning, uh, when I'm back here, I will be um, giving a different message and we will be looking at what it means to be lost and found in an affluent culture. What happens when we live in a culture where we are surrounded by so much and so much opportunity and where we experience a constant flow of new reward into our life that so often undermines our capacity to enjoy it? And we'll be looking at what that means and how we live and what the gospel has to say to us when we find ourselves in that situation. Now, this evening, I'm going to deal with a related but different theme, but they are, they are closely connected. And we'll be looking at this issue about the pursuit of pleasure and our drive for our own personal happiness. Now, let me just tell you a little bit about my own story so you know where I'm coming from in this journey. I was born in England at a very young age. My parents moved to the Middle East, so I spent my childhood in, um, in uh, Dubai and Sharjah in the 70s and then in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. And I really knew nothing about the Christian faith. I had no Christian exposure really at all um, during my childhood. And when I was about 16, my parents moved to a country called Cyprus. Now, when my parents moved to Cyprus, I really at that stage as an older teenager, I only had one desire in life. And that desire was to be cool. I believed that if I was cool, that that would make me happy. Now, I used to watch a huge number of films, a massive number of films, a very unreasonable number of films. Cyprus had very lax interpretations of copyright laws. We could get videos on VHS, if you know what that is. If you don't know what that is, speak to someone older and wiser than you. We used to get it on video before it had its world premiere. And so I used to want to act like I saw in the movies. And so all the images that I saw in the movies, I wanted for myself. Now, one of my heroes, um, therefore all of my heroes actually were actors. Uh, one of them was a man who amazingly has never won an Oscar despite producing an amazing and very impressive body of work. You may be familiar with him. His name is Arnold Schwarzenegger. He was someone I very much wanted to be like. One of his films starts with him walking up a mountain carrying a tree on his shoulder. And as he has the tree on his shoulder, a whole tree, he's also smoking a cigar. And I wanted to be like him. Now, I don't have the build to carry trees. So the part of the image I could take for myself was that of smoking cigars. So I used to smoke Cuban cigars. I used to think that made me cool. Another one of my heroes was James Bond. And I wanted to be like James Bond. In the novels and in the early films, James Bond had a silver cigarette case. I had a silver cigarette case. I had my initials engraved in the bottom right-hand corner. Now, this all is true. It is sad. I'm, I'm sorry to admit it in many ways, but sadly, it is true. Not only would I carry my cigarettes around in a silver cigarette case, I was so desirous to live out this image that, you know, on a box of match, there's a little stripe and you strike a match against it to light it. Well, I used to remove that and stick it to the bottom of my shoe. So having flipped open the case and flicked a cigarette into my mouth, I could take a match, light it, like I'd seen happen in the Westerns. Now, I got that idea from Clint Eastwood, who for me was the coolest of them all. There was no one cooler than him. Someone was once interviewing Clint Eastwood and they said, Mr. Eastwood, why does everybody think you're so cool? And he looked at them and he took a little cigarello out of his pocket, he put it on the table, he flicked it so it started spinning in the air. While it was spinning in the air, he produced a match from his back pocket and struck it, lighted, lighting it under the table. He then caught the cigar in his mouth, lit it, inhaled very deeply, blew one big smoke ring, three little smoke rings through the big smoke ring and said, I don't know. <laughs> now, all of this I did because I wanted to be happy. I wanted to be fulfilled. I wanted to have a full life. I wanted to experience and know it. And all of us, whether we are Christian or not, whether we are conscious of it or not, 
are living out a lifestyle and a life that we believe will make us happy. We're carving out for us an identity as Tracy has talked about, which is part of her testimony. We pursue those things that we think will fulfill us and we hunger for those things that we think will satisfy us and we run after them and we think that once we have them, then we will have all that we need. Now, it was about this time in my life that I met some Christians and there was something different about them. Tracy said it very well. I hadn't been trained how to fake a smile, but I was pretty good at spotting a fake smile. And I met these Christians, and for some reason, they seemed to be happy, even though they had less than me. Now, I was a bit suspicious of Christians, because I came from a very wealthy and powerful background. I felt about Christians the same way I felt about communists. They had nothing, but they wanted to share it with you. <laughs> but they seemed, unlike the communists I knew, to be so happy. And this intrigued me, it motivated me. And I started asking questions and speaking with them. And then I suggested to them they should set up a discussion group. And I brought pressure for them to start the discussion group. So my brother and I, both of us non-Christians, persuaded some non-Christians to start a youth group. Then we brought our friends to the youth group. Then when we sat with them to talk, we realized this was going to be a Christian youth group, which shouldn't have surprised us because they were Christians. So we started looking at the Bible and talking about who Christ is. And it was a very stimulating and very challenging environment. And then after about six months, I was talking with them one day and they said, you know, Michael, it's a shame. We were hoping to take all of you away for a weekend, but we can't do it. The government is stopping us. We can't get permission. I said, who do you need permission for? He said, well, we need permission because all of the, the campsites in the country are controlled by the government and you need permission from the chief of police and the minister for interior. I said, this won't be a problem. Give me a day. I went home that evening. I said to my mother, I want us, to, our youth group to go away, but we need some help. She said, what do you need? I said, do you know the chief of police? She said, of course. We were at school together. When I was a teenager, he asked me to go out with him and your uncle George knocked out his two front teeth and said if he ever spoke to me again, that he would take him out completely. <laughs> I said, we need his permission. She rang him up. She said, do you remember me? Of course I remember you. Would you do a favor for my son? I would do anything for you. All of a sudden we have permission for the chief of police. She hangs up the phone. She said, what else do you need? I said, I need permission from the minister for interior. She said, this is not a problem. Okay? Within 20 minutes, we had permission from the Minister for Interior. I rang up my friend. I said, okay, you've got it. The Chief of Police, the Minister of Interior, say yes. No one can say no to our family. <laughs> a few weeks later, we go off on this camp. I went up a day early to help set up that camp, to organize that camp, to put up the all, make all the preparations for that camp. On the next day, the camp started, and on the second day of that camp, I became a Christian. So I actually planned and organized my own conversion. <laughs> now, I can remember, I, I remember that moment of becoming a Christian very, very clearly. For six months, I'd been looking into this. And at the end of six months of asking questions, I was convinced the Christian faith was true and real. And that's very important you hear this, because even though I'm going to be talking about feeling and happiness, truth and reality are equally important and equally valid. So there's no point believing something simply because it will make you happy. Someone asked C.S. Lewis, have you become a Christian because it makes you happy? He said, I don't need God to make me happy. A good bottle of wine will do that. The question first and foremost, is it true, is it real? And I was convinced that it was true and I was also convinced that it was real. And this bothered me deeply because I was also convinced that even though the Christian faith was true and real, that if I became a Christian, life would be less enjoyable than I was having it right at that moment. Because I was basically very happy. I wasn't at a point of despair. I felt very happy. I felt very loved. I felt very secure. I had everything. I had every opportunity. I had wonderful education, wonderful parents, stable family. We had status. We had money. We had everything that we could possibly need. There was nothing missing. Except I could also tell that in one sense, these Christians had something that I just, I was missing out on. And this sense that the Christian faith was so true, was so true and real, I felt I couldn't ignore it anymore. And so on the second day of that camp, I went to some of my friends and I said to them, listen, I am going to become a Christian 
tonight. From now on, I won't be enjoying life anymore. <laughs> That's exactly what I said to them. And then I walked out of that talking to them, and I found some of these Christians, and I said, you need to pray with me now. And they prayed with me. And I was surprised by what happened next. Because misery is not what ensued. You very rarely hear a Christian sharing their testimony, saying something like this, before I was a Christian, I was depressed and miserable, but now God has turned my life completely around. Now I'm miserable and depressed. You don't normally hear testimonies like that. <laughs> and I was surprised by a joy I thought that I would never, ever know. A little while later, I'm at university. I've just got back from church. I'm talking with some friends, and they look at me and they say, you look so happy. Why are you so happy? Where have you been this morning? I said, I've been to church. They said, you've been to church and you're happy? <laughs> you could see the shock on their face. Surely if I'd been to church, I should be miserable. Now, sadly, we have a lot of churches in the Western world that prove this particular point. But here in Malaysia and here at DUMC, you're hopefully experiencing something very different. Now, what I want to talk to you, though, is about then this pursuit of happiness and this longing that we have. Because we look for it, we long for it. Some people are surprised to hear that it's right at the center of the Christian faith. Now, some people struggle with this idea that somehow happiness, joy, and so on is right at the center of the Christian faith. And they think there's something wrong with that. Now, there is someone who wrote a book on this subject in great detail, Dr. John Piper, called Desiring God. Now, you can read this book, it's quite heavy, but it is, it goes through it in great detail. Now, if you're not familiar with him, you also need to be aware of the fact he is a very strong Calvinist. If you're visiting this church, you're not a Christian, you may not know what that means. If you are a Christian, you may still know what that means. He's a Calvinist, but don't worry about it, you can't blame him. He had no choice in the issue. Now, <laughs> what he says in there, I will not even attempt to summarize. But let me just say this, at the heart of the Christian faith is a living, loving relationship with God. What should living, loving relationships be marked out by? Now some people think to talk about joy and happiness at the center of the Christian faith somehow makes the process of becoming a Christian selfish. It's all about us, it's all about me, what makes me happy. And so it's a very selfish desire and therefore a very, very poor form of worship of God. Other people struggle it from the other end. The Christian God seems demand, to demand praise. He demands worship. He demands that we love him. Well, what do we make of that, of this God saying, love me, love me, praise me, praise me? How do we understand that? Now, there's just so much to be said about this and I can't hope to cover all of it. But let me just give you one illustration that I hope, that I hope will make sense to you. I'm often away and I do a lot of travel. I'm in a lot of different countries. I'm often away from my wife and, and from my children. And I can't, I, one of the best things about traveling is going home, is going home at the end. I have a lot of fun when I'm away. I have even more fun when I return. As a matter of fact, right up until the service, I've been rebooking my flight because my original route back to England tomorrow was to go up to Hong Kong and then fly from Hong Kong back home. But there's a small typhoon coming in. And so now I've been madly scrambling and have been able to arrange now to get myself to Singapore and then from Singapore I can get home. Now when I've been away from my wife for a little while, I love to buy her flowers. There's a little florist at the top of our road where we live. They know me very, very, very well. I will buy my wife flowers all the time. So imagine when I get home at the beginning of next week that I decide I'm going to surprise her. So I stop by at the florist on way from the airport and I buy her a large bunch of flowers. And I have them behind my back, and instead of using my key in the door, I knock on the door. The door opens. And Anne looks at me, and I produce the flowers from behind my back, and I go, ta-da, these are for you. And she takes them, and she looks at them, and she says, Michael, these, these flowers are so beautiful. You, you shouldn't have bought them. Why did you buy them? And I say, because I know how happy they make you, and it makes me happy to see you happy. As a matter of fact, I've missed you so much this, 
these last few days that I've arranged a babysitter to come and look after our children this evening. I've booked a table at our favorite restaurant because there's nothing I would rather do. There's no place I would rather be. There's no one I would rather be with than with you tonight. Now, when I say that to her, she never looks at me and says, what do you mean there's nothing you wouldn't rather do? Why don't you think about me sometime? You're so selfish. (laughs) Why doesn't she say that? And the answer is, it is the nature of love to delight yourself in the other. The sign of a healthy relationship is when you delight in the other. A good marriage is one where that is the case. A good and honoring marriage is where you cannot wait to spend time, where you delight in their presence. You want to be with them. You want to spend time with them. You love them. It's honoring to them. And there is nothing more ultimately honoring to God than when all of our life and our being says, God, I want to be with you. There's no one I would rather spend time with. There's no one I would rather be in the presence of. There's no one I would rather talk to than you. This is the thing that fills my heart with the most desire, God. I want to spend time with you as the deer pants for the water. So my soul longs after you. I want to spend time with you. That's not selfish. That is the nature of a living, loving relationship. And what the Bible tells us, starting in the book of Genesis, and we're going to start in Genesis, we're going to move through the Old Testament, we're going to go into the Gospels, and we'll end in Revelation. So, Don't worry, I'm preaching a second different message tomorrow morning, so we can spend all evening together. I'll give you a break at around 8 a.m. tomorrow morning to have a little wash, and then you can stay for the second service. We'll have a lot of fun together. Nothing's more honoring when you say, Michael, I want to spend all my time with you, remember. (laughs) But the way this, the biblical story starts is this loving God decides to create a loving world. Now, I was talking with someone earlier today, and they were asking me this question, but look, if God set this up, if God put the rules in, if God did everything else, then surely there are lots of problems. Why has it gone wrong? Couldn't God have set it up differently so it didn't go wrong? Why so much pain and suffering? Why such terrible consequences when things do go wrong and so on? Now, I can't answer all of those questions now. That would be a whole other, whole other message. But let's just say a couple of things. Firstly, God did not create us because he needed us. That's not why he created us. When my first daughter was born, she was given a book. Well, she was given many books because people know I like books. One of the books was called Someone to Love. And the book went like this. There was this God and he was all alone. So one day he created a beautiful blue and green planet and he put people on it. And now at last he had someone to love. Ah. Now this book was not tossed aside lightly. I threw it with great force and it went straight into the bin. Because from a biblical point of view, this is not why God created us. God did not create us to solve the problem of cosmic loneliness. It is true that if God is purely one, if he is one person, that he is all alone. And it is also true to say that love is a quality that exists between persons. You need two of them. Now, I know, especially in today's culture, there are some men who wake up, they have a shower, they put gel in their hair, they look in the mirror and they go, I'm in love. But that's very sad. Love is a quality that is expressed and experienced between personal beings. And it's true that if God were one person, he would have to create other personal beings in order to experience love. That would make him cosmically lonely until he created us. But the God of the Bible is a trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons in one Godhead. God exists in a set of living, loving relationships. And out of that love that he experiences in his person, He then chooses to create us. So he doesn't do it out of need. He does it because it was his desire and his will to create us. And he created us to have relationship with him. Now, relationship to be meaningful involves lots of other things too. I don't know who your best friend is. Just imagine the closest best friend you have. Now imagine that unbeknown to you for all of these years, 
your parents, who are very worried about you, have been paying this person to be your best friend. Every year they send them a million and they say, you be the best friend to my son or daughter. Does that change the meaning of the relationship to you? Well, of course it changes us. It makes that relationship meaningless. Let's supposing they were being blackmailed to be nice to you. Does that change the relationship? Well, of course it does. For a loving God to create a world which is capable of living and loving relationship, he has to make it possible for that relationship to be real. And that's precisely the world we are told that God created. He created us in his image. That means that in some senses we are like him. And we have many capacities. And one of that capacity is to love and another capacity is to also to withhold that love. It's what makes all relationship meaningful. And a loving God created a loving world. He put us in it that we may experience and express love. Now all love exists also in a state of moral relationship. All relationships are morally governed. And here's where we begin to start to get into trouble. Because we began to believe that in order to be happy and fulfilled, we shouldn't embrace God and embrace his moral nature and his moral law. We felt that maybe that was denying us something that we needed. So we felt that if we somehow broke with him and broke away from this law, we would experience an increase of freedom in our life. Instead of being now imprisoned and shackled by this moral system that God had given us, we could set ourselves free from it. However, we need to realize that freedom is a moral concept. Freedom is not doing whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want to. That is not freedom. That is anarchy. I have traveled to some parts of the world and will be traveling to some parts of the world this year where this is precisely what has happened. People are doing whatever they want, whenever they want, however they want to. And the consequence is you can't walk the streets at night. It's not safe. When we abandon that system, we don't experience an increase of amount of freedom. We experience the loss of it. Freedom is a moral concept. It only exists within a moral framework. And once we have destroyed it, we find that we lose the freedom that we crave, that we believe that we need in order to be happy. Now, there's so much more that could be said about this, but let me just say one other thing, and it's a very important principle. In one sense, it is impossible to break God's moral law. It is impossible to break God's moral law in the following way. Let's suppose you want to break the law of gravity. So you climb to the top of this very beautiful building. Now, how tall is it? 30 meters? 40 meters? And you want, you climb yourself to the top of this building in an attempt to break the law of gravity. When you get to the top, you tie a red cape around your neck, you put a big S on your chest, and a pair of red underpants outside <laughs> everything else you're wearing and you throw yourself from the top of the building in order to break the law of gravity. What will you break? You will break yourself while proving the law in the very process. In that sense, it is impossible to break God's moral law. Whenever we try to break God's moral law, we end up breaking ourselves while proving it in that process. Let me just read to you from Isaiah chapter 1, just a few verses. And as I read this, this is from Isaiah 1 chapter 4, I would like you to ask you to imagine in your head, what is the voice with which God is speaking? What kind of tone of voice does God have as he says these words? Because he's speaking to his people. He says, woe to the sinful nation, a people whose guilt is great, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on him. 
Why should you be beaten anymore? Why do you persist in rebellion? Your whole head is injured. Your whole heart is afflicted. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head, there is no soundness. Only wounds and welts and open sores, not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with oil. Your country is desolate and your cities are burned with fire. Let's just stop there. What is the tone that you hear? Anger? Frustration? Now, I find this a very interesting passage. Did you notice the two questions that God asks? Now, have you noticed that sometimes parents ask their children silly questions? Have you noticed that? We say things like, do you want a smack? <laughs> As if any child will sort of go, hmm. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to need two because I'm, I'm naughty now and I'm going to be naughty a bit later as well. So... And here we appear to have two questions that on the surface of them may, not may, may, may look foolish, but they're not foolish at all. Look at what God says. Why should you be beaten anymore? Why do you persist in your rebellion? Every time we break God's moral law, we get hurt. Has anyone ever lied to you? Have you ever been stabbed in the back by a friend? Has anyone ever cheated you, betrayed you, stolen from you? Did it hurt? Every time we break God's moral law, we get hurt. And God here now looks at a nation which seems to be steeped in, a, in sinful ways and says, why do you want to be beaten? Why persist in your rebellion? Look at you. From the bottom of your feet to the top of your head, you're in pain, you're broken, you're suffering. Not only are you suffering, your cities are suffering, your nation is suffering, everything around you is being destroyed. Why, God says, why persist in this rebellion against me? As I read this, I don't read anger, I read a God who is pleading with people to say, stop doing that. Don't go that way. In verse 18, a little bit later in this chapter, God is going to say to them, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they can be made as white as snow. And God is pleading with them. He's pleading with us. He's pleading with me. He's pleading with you. Are you sitting here this evening and you are aware that you are being broken as you pursue pleasure? There are things which you are doing, places you are going, habits you have formed, things you're watching on the internet, relationships you've got involved in, things you're doing with your money that you actually know before God are wrong. You shouldn't be doing them, but you want to do them because you think they will make you happy. And you're thinking, no, 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 no. I, God, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna do what you would have me do because look at all this happiness over here. And God is not debating with you about happiness. He's not even debating with you about your desire to be happy. What he's debating with us about is where is the real happiness found? That's the question. I can remember before becoming a Christian, feeling that if I became a Christian, God was going to change some things about me I didn't want him to change. Now that involved a lot of things for me. One of them was to do with women. And I can remember thinking about one particular woman in particular, uh, one particular woman. She was a model, actually. And I had unsuccessfully been trying to seduce this woman for several months, but I felt I was making progress. And in the back of my head, I can remember thinking, if I become a Christian, God's going to stop that. I don't want him to stop that because I want to be happy. I'll never forget two days after becoming a Christian, I met this lady. And she looked at me and she, she knew me fairly well by then. She said, there's something different about you. You've completely changed. I said, I have. She said, what's happened to you? I said, I don't know if I can explain to you. She said, try. I said, well, two days ago, I became a Christian. She said, what does that mean? I said, all I know is I'm not the same person I was before. God has changed me. 
And she looked at me and she said straight away, would you like to sleep with me? I remember looking at her saying, if you'd asked me two days ago, <laughs> the answer would have been yes. But today, the answer is no. And I was surprised, not by the answer I gave, but by the fact I didn't feel any disappointment in giving it. He was changing my heart. I'd been down that road before. I know where that leads to, and it doesn't ultimately fulfill you. What are the things that you are doing, holding on to, because you believe that by holding on to them, they will make you happy, but actually they're in the process of breaking you? The Bible calls this bondage, spiritual bondage, being imprisoned in a cage, unable to break free thinking that somehow we know better for ourselves when there's a loving God who actually knows what's best for us. And so we persist in the lifestyle. We persist in repeating it. We begin to think there's something wrong with us. Everyone else is doing it. They're happy, right? I'm doing it. I should be feeling happy too. There's not something wrong with the system. There's something wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with you. If you go this route, this is where you will end up. God promises it. There's a big difference between a promise and a threat, and this is not a threat. God is not threatening people here. Look, if I, supposing you're walking with your eyes closed towards a cliff, I tend, sometimes I tend to preach with my eyes closed, so I could use me as an illustration. So I'm preaching, my eyes are closed, and I'm walking closer and closer and closer to you. Now, this is a small drop. This is, what, a one and a half meters. So imagine that this place is remodeled to sit 50,000 people, and I'm 30 meters up in the air. And I keep walking. My eyes closed, I'm so engrossed in quoting something. And someone from the front row yells, stop! And I say, don't interrupt me. <laughs> and they say, you're gonna be destroyed, you're gonna, you, you hit that, he said, you're gonna have a terrible fall and it's gonna be really painful, you'll probably even break your head. That would be crazy for me to look at them and say, stop threatening me. They're not threatening me anything. They're making me a promise. If I keep going that way, that's exactly what will happen. There's a difference between a threat and a promise. God is not threatening anyone here. He's promising them. You keep walking this way. You're going to fall off this moral cliff. And this is what will happen. And this is what is indeed is happening. A loving God created us for relationship with him. All of these relationships are governed by his nature, his character, his moral law. And the tragedy is, is that in wanting to be free, in pursuing our own happiness, we've broken his law, we've broken our lives, and we live in a broken world. And we see the evidence all around us, all the time. Every time you pick up the newspaper, all of the evidence is there. But we also read something even more incredible. That not only do we live in this broken world, and this has broken God's heart. We also read, sorry, we, live, we have broken this law and we've broken our lives and we live in a broken world. We also read this has broken God's heart. Jesus wept while he was on this earth. Jesus looked at Jerusalem and he said, I have longed to gather you like a mother hen gathers her chicks to her, but you were not willing. The God who created us, the God who knows us, the God that, who knows the way that we should walk in, even when we turn our back and go our own way and begin destroying ourselves and everything around us, weeps over us. He longs for us. He has a desire for us. He is desperate for us to come to know him. And this has broken his heart. Now the solution to all of this moral failure in our life is not religion. Now I don't have time to read all of this to you. 
But let me just read a few verses here. This is from verse 11. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I've had more than enough of burnt offerings of rams and fat of fatted animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who's asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moon Sabbath convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals, I hate with all my being. They've become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. Now, isn't this interesting? Have you ever been to church and been bored? Obviously not this church. You should come to England. God is saying, look, I've been. And it is wearying to me. I'm tired of it. Not literally tired. That would be impossible for God. But emotionally, I'm weary of burdening them. I'm, I'm tired of this. All of this is meaningless. All of this religious activity. Now the irony is, when he says, who ordered this from you? This trampling of my courts. Who ordered you to come into my temple? Who ordered you to come into my courts? Well, who ordered them to come? Well, God did. But he hasn't told them to come to perform a ritual they're not meant to be there simply to perform a service. They are there to make a connection with the living God. And there's no connection going on. Everyone's going through the motions. And they've invented some of their own festivals and rituals and so on. And God doesn't like any of them. Religion is not the answer. Religion is not the problem, solution to this problem. It's actually part of the problem. Certainly a problem to God. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. God is pleading with his people. Stop going that way. Stop breaking yourself. Come to me, he says. You know, it's interesting what we, how we think of the gospel sometimes. Because we sometimes misunderstand what's going on. We were talking yesterday, for those of you who were at the seminar, about the nature of God's judgment. Now, sometimes we don't like that phrase because we think of judgment as something which makes something worse. But what judgment does, first and foremost, is it reveals things as they actually are. Have you noticed that? Any false judgment first happens when the judgment that is passed doesn't reveal things as they are. There is a miscarriage of justice when the truth isn't seen, when reality isn't revealed. But all good judgment starts with revealing things as they really are. And God's judgment with us begins revealing things to us as we really are. Now, we sometimes we, we struggle with that. We don't like it. We like to think that we're good and that somehow if we do enough things to make God happy that somehow we can make ourselves good before him, hence all the religion. I mean, it's an old story, but you must know the story of the boy who wanted a bicycle for Christmas. You know that story? And he was desperate for a bicycle for Christmas. He told his parents that's what he wanted. He told everybody that's what he wanted. It was New Year's, it was Christmas Eve. He'd searched the house. He'd looked at every present and there wasn't a single bicycle-shaped present anywhere. So he's panicking. And so just before, or just after they put him to bed, the, children, the parents have put him to bed and they've gone to bed themselves, the boy's lying there thinking, I really want a bicycle. So he gets out of bed, he gets on his knees and he says, okay, God, all I want for Christmas is a bicycle. That's all I want, I promise. So you give me a bicycle tomorrow and I'm going to be good for a month. I won't do anything wrong. I'll be perfect. Just, just send me the bicycle. Amen. He gets into bed. Now, he's quite an intelligent boy. He begins thinking, a month is a very long time. He's always getting into trouble at school. 
So he gets back out of bed, he gets down on his knees, okay, God, how about this? I'll do a week. One week, I won't do anything wrong, but I, please send me that bicycle. That's all I'm asking for. You send me a bicycle, it's a small thing, I'll be good for a whole week. He gets back into bed. Then he starts thinking about how sometimes his mother asks him to do things he doesn't do them. And he gets into trouble at home occasionally. He's not very naughty, but you know, things just happen. He thinks that's really hard. He gets back out of bed, he kneels up and he says, okay, God, one day. I won't do anything wrong tomorrow. I'll be perfect, just please, you send me the bicycle, amen. He gets back into bed. And he's lying in bed and he's thinking about his sister who can be so annoying. She sits next to him at the dinner table with her finger out like this, right next to his shoulder. And when it touches him, she says, it wasn't me, he moved. My finger was still, he moved into my finger and he's thinking this is bound to happen tomorrow. So he realizes that won't work either. Then he has a very interesting idea. He gets out of bed, he goes quietly down the stairs. He opens the door to his house and quietly closes it behind him. Opposite him, his house is a small Catholic church. He knows it's open all the time. He sneaks across the road, he opens the church, and on his left, there's a little alcove, and in the alcove, there is standing a statue of Mary. He takes the statue, he puts it in his pocket. He goes back across the road, quietly up the stairs into his bedroom. He puts the statue of Mary in the closet and he locks the door. He gets down on his knees and he says, okay, Jesus, if you ever want to see your mother again. <laughs> we, we're not good people. God knows it. He knows the things that we get up to, the secret things in our life that we think no one else sees. He's seen it all. And he sees the brokenness that's ensued. And God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And God came to the world in the person of Jesus Christ for a broken people who had broken his law, led broken lives, and lived in a broken world. And as Jesus Christ went to the cross, on the night before he was betrayed, he said, this is my body broken for you. And God came into this world and he took the brokenness and the pain of what we had done wrong onto himself. He was broken for us. The pain, the shame, the consequences, the penalty, everything that we had done wrong, all the consequences that flow from the things that we do wrong, he took on into himself on the cross. And he was broken for us. But it didn't stop there. Because on the third day, he rose again from the dead. He conquered over death and pain and shame. And he now comes to a broken people. And he says, let me give you a new life. Let me make you whole. Let me help you discover the reason for which you were brought into this world. And as Tracy said, he doesn't just simply want to forgive us and to redeem us and to restore us. He loves us. He has a plan for us. He has a purpose for us. He has something that he wishes for us to take from him. And when you embrace it, you will know a joy that you cannot possibly know in this world. And you will have a joy within you that no one can possibly remove from you. A few years ago, I was speaking in Albania, and after I had finished speaking there, uh, a man, a Muslim gentleman who owns one of the biggest TV stations came up to me and he said, I'm very interested by what you're saying. And there had been some cartoons published in some Western newspapers that had caused a lot of offense, and he said, look, I have the biggest TV program in Albania, and afterwards I talked with my friends, they said, it's true, 80% of the people watch this breakfast show, and he said, will you come on my breakfast show? So I said, sure. And the next morning, I arrived and they were putting makeup on me. It's one of the few times in my life I've worn makeup. And as they're doing that, the owner says to me, by the way, when you're on my TV station, please refrain from talking about your beliefs. And I said, okay. So that's gonna be hard. 
So they start asking me questions. They're asking me questions about tolerance. What does it mean to live in a tolerant society? Freedom. What does it mean to live in a freedom, free society? My first degree was in law. So they asked me about legal systems and how legal systems should interplay with all of that. And then the interviewer looks at me and says, what is your personal belief about all of these things? He says, and where does God fit into this? And I thought, well, I'll answer the question. I said, well, I'm a Christian. I said, as a Christian, what I would say is this. There is a freedom and a peace the state can give you, but the state can take it away. But there is an inner joy and freedom that Christ can give you, and no one can take it from you. And my prayer would be that everyone would come to know this inner peace and freedom. And it was the end of the show. A red light came on. They'd run out of time. It was 8 a.m. They thanked me very much for coming on, and I walked off the platform, and the the man who owns the TV station came up to me and shook my hand. And I said, was it okay, my answer to the last question? He said, oh, that's fine. You can say that. That's not what you believe. That is who you are. Wow. When you say yes to Christ, it changes who you are. Where are you this evening? Who are you? Tracy's been asking that question already. Is it possible that you are a believer and you are breaking yourself all over again? Christ set you freedom, set you free for freedom, and yet somehow you're being sucked back in to a, a slavery in your life which you feel has imprisoned you and trapped you. He set you free to know joy. Is it possible that you're exchanging that for something that the world gives you only to find that it's disappointing you? It's in danger of ruining your life, the lives of those around you. Is it possible that you're here tonight and you're on the outside looking in? You have never come to know that joy and that freedom that Christ gives you. Well, I'm going to invite you, if that is you, to come to the front of this place and we will pray with you that you may know the forgiveness, you may know the freedom, you may know the healing, and you may know the joy that only God himself can bring. It doesn't mean that you will never know any pain in your life, but what it does mean is that no matter what challenges come your way, he will be at the very center of it there with you. Let me use an old story that I, I learned from my boss. Clearly this is a true story because it's a story about three turtles. You know this one? Three turtles have a picnic. They, they pack up the picnic. One of the turtles has made sandwiches, so he brings those. Second turtle has prepared drinks, he brings those. The third turtle just comes along for company. They set off at breakneck speed to the woods. They're halfway to the woods and it starts raining. So they hide under a big rock. The first two turtles turn to the third turtle and they say, look, we brought food and drink, you brought nothing. You go back, you go and get the umbrellas. When you come back with the umbrellas, we'll continue on our journey and then we'll have the picnic. And the third turtle says, no way. As soon as I go around the corner, you're gonna eat everything, you're gonna drink everything. When I come back, there'll be nothing here. The first two turtles say, we'll never do such a thing. The third turtle says, that's exactly what you'll do. No, we won't, yes, you will. Eventually, the first two turtles swear on their shells. They will not eat the food or drink the drink till the third turtle returns. So the third turtle disappears off around the rock to get the umbrellas. So the other two turtles, they wait. Minutes become hours. Hours become days. After three days, the first turtle turns to the second turtle and says, okay, how about it? Why don't we eat the sandwiches and drink the drink? And from behind the rock, the third turtle says, if you do, I won't get the umbrellas. <laughs> Why is he there? The third turtle's being paralyzed into indecision for fear of missing out. That's why he hasn't gone. Many people, when they come to consider Christ's complete claim on their life, whether that's as a Christian, where he's calling you back to repentance to him, or whether it's a non-Christian, we, we think, but if I do that, I will miss out. You will miss out. You will miss out on the brokenness, the pain, the shame, the guilt, the slavery that comes from breaking God's law and knowing that brokenness in your life. And by not turning to him, you are missing out on all that he has for you. 
the plans he has for you, the desires he has for you, the life he has for you, the things he wants to do with you, the dreams that he has for you, for which you were brought into this world and for which you alone can fulfill. You're missing out on him and all of that. Don't miss out on him. If you are prepared to acknowledge your sin and repent before him, he is faithful and just. He will forgive your sins. He will heal your hearts and he'll set you on a new course. You stop going this way, that's moral suicide, and you start going this way. This is life. And he wants you to walk in it. Do you, are you in that position this evening where you know that your response this evening before him has to be, God, I'm giving myself back completely to you. I'm not in the position I wanted to be and I'm not in the position I ever thought I would be. Would you like me to pray for you? Well, if you would like me to pray for you, then we're going to ask you to stand or to stand and come forward. Okay, to come forward. Should I invite, do you have everyone stand? So I'm wondering, could I invite all of you to stand? It's just easier. And as you stand, maybe if there are some members of the ministry team would be able to pay, come forward. But if you know you're in that position where you would like to be prayed for this evening, then come forward down here and we will pray for you now this evening that you may find that right relationship with him.